Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Nepal, the devastating earthquake, and what it'll take to rebuild a shattered country and economy. Who will step up to help one of the world's poorest nations? And what lessons can be learned for the new Nepal when it eventually rises? Also this week, oceanomics. Think about our greatest resource and when taking too much out means irreparable damage. Overfishing, climate change and mangrove deforestation, we look at exactly what they're all doing to the world's ocean economy. And go west. With disruption all the rage in the tech world, we'll find out why Motor City is moving to Silicon Valley. It came out of nowhere, as these things do, and was merciless in its destruction. The 7.9 magnitude earthquake in Nepal, home to the world's tallest mountain, wedged between two growing economic superpowers, and yet still one of the poorest nations in the world. The quake was the worst in 80 years. It's affected 8 million people, just under a third of the population, with upwards of 5,000 people killed. The economic losses, they could be as much as $10 billion, uh, according to an estimate from the U.S. Geological Survey. The cost of rebuilding, perhaps $5 billion, according to IHS. All this in a country with economic growth that was already expected to slow, an unemployment rate of more than 40%, and a reliance on agriculture, tourism and remittances to support its $19 billion economy. And so the international support has rolled in, led by Nepal's closest neighbours. India dispatched 16 military and civilian aircraft, eight helicopters and a thousand members of its national disaster response. Nepal's northern neighbour, China, has a 62-member search and rescue team on the ground and has pledged more than $10 million to the effort. And the Asian Development Bank's given $3 million for humanitarian efforts and pledged another $200 million for reconstruction work. And every last dollar will be needed when you see the enormity of the task, something our correspondent Andrew Simmons did firsthand. We start with his report on what the Nepalese army's been doing and indeed trying to do in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. It's an operation that only stops for refueling and briefings. But while the military may have been mobilized quickly, it hasn't been enough to bring the relief this country so desperately needs. Beyond the sprawl of Nepal's capital is where the extra effort is needed most. From this altitude, you can see just how inaccessible this terrain is to the Special Forces rescuers. Lieutenant Colonel Fapper really has a colossal job on his hands. Perched on mountainsides, homes that have collapsed, but the army says there would be no way of reaching anyone trapped inside unless teams were winched down from helicopters at hundreds of thousands of locations. And here, a landslide on a small village that's disappeared in a mound of earth. The number of dead is unknown. This is one of many further disasters in the wake of the quake and its aftershocks. Lieutenant Colonel Thapa is defending his operation against international criticism insisting that while so many have died, few people are recognizing or even counting how many have been saved. One uh, MI-17 helicopter of the Nepalese army, if, if I'm correct, flew 68 missions on the day in one 24-hour cycle, pulled out over 370 people. Landing at the town of Dulokel, it isn't long before the commander sees his ground forces in action bringing casualties to a district hospital that should be treating less than 300 patients. Right now, the figure stands at just under 800, and doctors admit the situation is at breaking point. Muna Lama has a serious back injury. She's traveled for more than 100 kilometers for treatment on a floor. There are no beds, no mats, no trolleys left. This hospital is totally overwhelmed. It's remarkable the doctors and nurses keep going. They've been working since Saturday. We have to help them. That's why we are like uh, we are left uh, undamaged uh, in this earthquake. We, even we were at our homes, but we, we escaped and we just came to the hospital. Since then, we are working. The treatment starts on the streets outside as the casualties keep coming in. People continue to get injured when unstable buildings collapse, often because of aftershocks. Others have been traveling long distances for treatment. At first sight here, you'd be forgiven for thinking 
the earthquake had only just happened. Well, we mentioned the aid efforts earlier, and one group which takes both a short and long-term view in these situations uh, is the Asia Development Bank. Now, Kenichi Yokoyama is the Nepal country director for the ADB, joining us via Skype from Kathmandu. Mr. Yokoyama, tell me first of all about the quake itself, the moment it hit. What was it like? Actually, I was uh, uh, out of Kathmandu at that time visiting a project site uh, in, in front of the project office, and uh, it was a huge, huge shake, and... Uh, 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 people are difficult to stand. Uh, so I, I think I would say this is the uh, uh, biggest earthquake I have ever experienced. I'm a Japanese, I experience a lot of earthquakes. So then how do you start doing your job? Because, you know, it's difficult to even think about rebuilding at this point when there's such a, a major recovery effort going on. How do you approach a situation like this? Well, at this moment, the major efforts are uh, rescue and recovery and such. And uh, ADB is also providing just, uh, uh, we are just approved and, and uh, uh, disbursed to $3 million uh, for emergency relief. So uh, we hope, we are expecting that uh, the fund is used to most immediate to relief functions. And at the same time, there's a discussion uh, already initiated how we uh, undertake the, the damage assessment and reconstruction planning process. And so tell me about that uh, assessment at this stage. Can you actually make an assessment or is it just estimates at the moment about what this could run into as far as costs go? Well, at this stage, it's uh, very hard to say, uh, you know, uh, most of the focus is really to help people or who got, uh, you know, damaged. And uh, there are still many, many people outside. And uh, there's an advisory saying that the people should stay out of the buildings because of the aftershocks. So uh, the major focus as of now is uh, search, rescue, research, uh, and uh, relief. And uh, at this stage, it's very difficult. It's just one information we got from the government. Finance minister has stated that the damage could be 50% of the GDP, which is about $10 billion. But this really needs to uh, be looked at uh, objectively. So does there need to be a rethink when it comes up to the rebuilding eventually? You know, I, I've not been there, but people have told me about the, these tallish buildings and narrow streets. And when something like this happens, clearly the infrastructure can't cope. Does there need to be a rethink before the rebuilding actually happens? Well, I think in case of Nepal, we also need to respect the, you know, cultural asset and heritage value of the uh, cities. So I don't think uh, we really need to change the shape of the uh, urban, you know, uh, Kathmandu character. But the important thing is the building should be built uh, in an earthquake, earthquake resilient manner. So, so in that sense, uh, you know, there's a good building code in the country, but uh, compliance has been extremely poor. So much more efforts. And I think people are now willing to, abide, I mean, comply with the building code and uh, do the retrofitting activities and also rebuilding the, you know, the demolished house to a uh, 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 good building, meeting the fully, fully meeting the building code. But didn't Nepal have problems already so far as infrastructure goes? Um, uh, not having enough electricity, things like that. Again, things which maybe will now have to be redesigned and rethought. Well, actually, the lack of infrastructure has been the focus of the development efforts, and uh, the country's uh, uh, capital expenditure has been about 3.3% of GDP, which we have been advising that uh, this should be something like 8 to 12%. So uh, we have been focusing much on infrastructure building, and particularly power sector. And uh, before the earthquake, we had been actually hopeful that within three years, with the existing investments of hydropower, the power situation can, can change and uh, uh, this can uh, also lead to the uh, growth, uh, much higher growth. I guess the sad thing is that this perhaps shouldn't have even taken an earthquake to, to realise that infrastructure spending needed to increase. Yes, of course. I think it's a quite a challenge. Now the country really needs to you know, expand the infrastructure investment. Now they are facing additional, to, additional needs to invest uh, money for uh, rebuilding the country. So, but I think uh, for that, I think international community it can help uh, build this uh, uh, country in a more uh, much resilient and a better shape.
Uh, well, that's what I was going to ask you about. Who are the most important players in this, do you think? Is it uh, China and India particularly as Nepal's neighbours who are best placed to step up? Well, actually, uh, international donors are now uh, uh, starting the discussion for uh, coordinated uh, assistance, and I'm sure uh, China and India will be a big player. But at the same time, uh, World Bank, ADB, United Nations, and EU, also those uh, major donors are also joining hands to assess the damages and also uh, provide necessary financial and technical and personnel support. All right, Kenichi Yokoyama from the Asia Development Bank, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts this week. And still ahead on counting the cost, the big move west for the US car industry. If you want to go electric, then head to the valley. We'll tell you about that a little later on. Now here's a new word, oceanomics. Well, to be fair, it's a made up word, but it's a good way of contemplating the value of the ocean's riches. If you were to think about the ocean as an economy, you'd be looking at output worth around $2.5 trillion a year. That would pop the ocean, as it were, in at number seven in the world's top ten economies after the US, China, Japan, Germany, France and the UK. It generates hundreds of millions of jobs in sectors like tourism, fishing and shipping, and billions of people rely on it as a food source. Those numbers come from a new WWF report, which we'll discuss in a moment with our guests, but First, we have to think about where this economy is going wrong. The ocean's resources are being eroded, potentially brought down entirely by overfishing, disappearing coral reefs and endemic mangrove destruction. This from our environment editor, Nick Clark, here in Qatar. Oceans cover more than two thirds of our planet. Not only a vast multi-trillion dollar resource, but also crucial in the cycle of life itself. On the shores of the Gulf, a research team from Qatar's Environmental Studies Centre on its way to study a vital component of the world's oceans, mangroves. The salt marshes here providing an ecosystem uniquely adapted to the Gulf's extreme conditions and home to all types of animals. They're also capable of storing up to eight times more CO2 than tropical forests and it's important to understand how they work. We are looking at uh the capability of the mangrove to absorb nutrients, the capability for it to store carbon, the uh, support it gives to the local fisheries and the species diversity in the Gulf. And the bottom line is, fragile ecosystems like mangroves are fundamental to the general state of health of the world's oceans. The problem is that mangroves are being ripped up and destroyed along coastlines all over the world. In fact, the rate of loss is more than three times that of deforestation on land. And of course, as far as oceans are concerned, it doesn't end there. According to a worldwide Fund for Nature report, the entire multi-trillion dollar marine resource is in danger of failing. The oceans are changing faster than at any other point in tens of millions of years, with intense pressure from overfishing, pollution and acidification. The acceleration that we have seen in the last uh, particularly 100 years is staggering. And, uh, you know, ecosystems like oceans can recover, and this is the good news, can recover very fast if we don't reach the tipping point, if we don't reach the no return point. But we are at risk in the next 20 years or so that if this continues, uh, actually the ocean will not be able to recover for hundreds of years, for generations to come. The message is we are running down our ocean assets and pushing the marine economy into the red. By couching the oceans now flagging health in sheer monetary terms, the report's authors hope they're speaking a language the world's decision makers may just understand. We're off to Brisbane, Australia now to talk more about this. Joining us is the director of the Global Change Institute there in Queensland, Ove Guldberg, who's also the lead writer on that report. Ove, thank you for your time. Take me through how you quantify what an ocean economy is. Well, what this study did, and it really took an economic view on this resource that we often treat as endless. And so working with the Boston Consulting Group, uh, literally went to uh, a number of assets that could be identified, those that could be measured, and then came up with sort of some market value. So if you take fisheries, for example, and you take the biomass of fish, you know, the sort of average um, you know, price per kilogram of, of, of fish and so on, you can get to the sort of asset size. Then if you know the productivity of that, you can actually then 
um, get an estimate of sort of the dividend that that pays. Now you go across tourism, a whole bunch of sectors, shipping, trade and so on, and you get to this $24 trillion, uh, which is, a, if it were a country, would be the seventh largest economy uh, on the planet. Right, so this is the thing. When you have an economy of that size, as it were, uh, you have to nurture it, you have to protect it and, and, and get the most out of it. Is that actually happening? Are there people and, and, and groups out there who actually treat it that way, given that the oceans provide so much economic output and so many jobs and livelihoods all over the mm. world? Well, you know, under ideal circumstances with an asset performing you know, such a, an enormous role, because we're, we're deriving a, around $2.5 trillion in benefits uh, each year from this ocean asset. And you'd think that there'd be great steps to uh, essentially preserve the asset. But unfortunately, uh, we're eroding the asset. And of course, that's eventually and already uh, affecting the dividend that it can play, pay in terms of support for humanity. So really, that's what we are trying to do in this study is to sort of say, OK, here's the asset. Uh, here's what it's delivering each year. Mm. And then, of course, are we looking after it? And, of course, the answer is no. When you look at fisheries, you've got 90% of them are on the planet, which are either fully exploited or are in collapse. They're overexploited. You look at the way we're dealing with coastal tourism and we're degrading the very assets that that uh, industry depends on. And so the bottom line is that if we are really, you know, this is an economic system that we're, we're depending on, we need to now push the reset button and start to look at this as an asset that we need to preserve. And that's what this report's about. Yeah, problem is, over, and not to be defeatist about it at all, is that this is a really difficult job. This, it's, it's easy to exploit. There's a heck of a lot of water and ocean in this world. And, and, and trying to protect it or police it is a, is a real uphill task. Well, we think there is a way to solve this problem. And it really comes down to uh, a series of actions that we need to strive towards. Now, um, we're not going to uh, get uh, the fisheries fixed up overnight, but we mm. can start to work towards, now we know what the problem is, we can start to wor work towards so solutions. So when you take um, you know, tuna fisheries, uh, the big problem there is that they're being overexploited, not just because people don't care, mm. it's because these stocks range between countries across some you know, international borders and often into the, you know, the open ocean where there's no sort of... Uh, uh, jurisdiction. Mm. It's actually trying to get solutions to those sorts of problems which uh, really cre need the multilateral uh, you know, collaboration. Uh, and so this is really just being practical, saying, look, what are the problems? What are the solutions? And we can move towards them. I mean, things like climate change with the COP21 coming up at the end of the year. Um, anyone who understands the problem is, is uh, we, we, will, we will move to a solution because not to is going to be extremely problematic. So, yes, it's an ambitious study, but it's essentially setting the goals, the landscape, in a language that business and government should understand. Just briefly, of what sort of, and I, and I know this is a new report which has come out, but what sort of reactions do you get from governments? If you say that you're trying to build this in a way that people will understand, are they responding to it? We've got very positive feedback from almost all sectors. Um, this is a, a problem which I think uh, most people have had a feeling about for some time. You know, when you look at the fact that, um, you know, um, the, the state of the ocean in terms of plastic pollution, uh, the state of our fisheries and so on, um, and then you start to put it in these economic terms, I think it clarifies and I think has um, appealed to a lot of people. Now we know what the problem is. We know that it's valuable. There's no question about that. Now we need to move to those solutions. So in, in a way, you know, counting the cost here hmm. has been quite important because uh, you know, that's the language uh, of governments and companies. Of Hogelberg talking oceanomics with us on Counting the Cost. We thank you very much for your time this week. UK elections taking place on May the 7th. It's been dominated by the economy and immigration, with some voters deeply unhappy with the free movement of people from the European Union. And so Prime Minister David Cameron has promised a referendum on staying in the EU if he remains in power. Easy to forget, though, how many Brits there are actually living outside the UK itself. For example, Lawrence Lee has this report from Spain, where one million Britons live. It's still quiet in the little town of Sabanillas, but soon enough the bars and restaurants will be full of European sun seekers. But getting on for half the population here is British. In O'Callaghan's bar we found some of them 
putting the world to rights, and there's plenty wrong with the UK. People from uh, try to say, Romania, say, or the people who are in uh, Calais now, boarding out in the camps, the hundreds of camps in Calais, could they apply and move to Australia? No. Can they move anywhere in Europe? Yes. Where do they want to go? Britain. Yeah, well, of course they want to go. Mean, yeah, yeah they, they, want, they want to go to Britain. And to be fair, probably so would I. Wouldn't, wouldn't you? Over the road, Dean shows us his contribution to Spain. He founded a charity which other British people here can contribute to. The money goes to the Spanish poor. This, he says, helps define the difference between the right and the wrong sort of migrant. An immigrant is someone who takes and an expat is someone who goes to somewhere else and then gives a little bit back. Is that what you mean? That tends to be the perception of most of the people that I know locally, yes. Mm. Yeah, it is. If there were ever an election on the Costa, then the Conservative Party would win with the sort of numbers usually reserved for a Central Asian dictatorship. And the UK Independence Party would do quite well too. And that's ironic because if they had their way and Britain left the European Union, then all these folk would probably have to go back home to the country they gave up as a lost cause. The Costa, of course, is no stranger to outsiders. The ancient Romans, the Phoenicians, Arabs, Moors have all colonised these shores. Now the Russians are busy buying up the coast. So for bar owners like Oscar, British immigrants are nothing to fear or resent. For me right now, it's fantastic because the majority of my customers are from all over the place. Mostly they're English. Britain is in a good place economically, so they end up bringing a lot to this area. You get the sense that even though many British immigrants here feel the old country has gone to the dogs, their new home can end up a rather lonely place. It certainly looks a bit tarnished and tatty, lacking the glamour and optimism it had half a century ago. In fact, much like the Briton, they've given up on. Finally this week, cars, electric cars. So if you want to find the heart of that business in the United States these days, you better forget Motor City in Detroit. Head to the West Coast with a cool tech kids hangout, like John Hendred did for this next report. The center of gravity in the American auto industry is shifting westward from Detroit towards Silicon Valley. In January, Ford opened a new Palo Alto Technology Center, a place where software and hardware meet. Being here in Silicon Valley, and being viewed as part of Silicon Valley is very important for our future. It's important to get the right talent that we need coming into the company, and it supports our overall efforts of driving innovation for our customers. Here, cars are designed by virtual reality with ultralight carbon parts, the kind used on the upcoming Ford GT supercar with self-adjusting height for unexpected speed bumps and a self-adjusting spoiler to optimize wind resistance. Ford has traveled part way down the road to self-driving vehicles, at least when it comes to the annoying task of parallel parking. I'm operating the gas and brake, but this one is entirely steering itself. See? No hands. Ford is also researching making cars more internet connected, and there they're playing catch up with Palo Alto-based Tesla, with a dashboard that looks like it was built by NASA. Tesla has developed a niche in the $100,000 range. The challenge is seeing if it can do the same for moderate-priced cars, with a $35,000 model due in 2017. As cars increasingly morph into rolling computers, analysts say car makers will look ever more to Silicon Valley, the tree-lined home to thousands of experts in speech technology, cybersecurity, and data management. Autos are becoming mobile commuting and communications platforms. If you want to be on the bleeding edge of that stuff, you want to be where you can incorporate that, that sort of technology into the auto as quickly as possible. That logic is likely to attract other U.S. automakers building an island of Detroit in Northern California. And that is our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. It'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. We're also looking for your feedback and suggestions on social media. So you can uh, get in touch with us by tweeting either me, at Kamal AJE. Our business editor is there as well. He is at Abid Oliver Ali on Twitter, and do use the hashtag AJCTC. Or just drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.